I had the option to uh, begin the show with a full-blown produced show intro, and it just seemed so completely inappropriate to do so the day after the news that Christopher Hitchens had died. All the fanfare and all the production and whatnot, I just, I just couldn't do it. It's been an unusual 24 hours. And I don't know about you, but even as we saw Christopher Hitchens deteriorate in health, some part of me just sort of felt like he would beat it just because of who he was, <laughs> because he was this force of nature, because he would not be quelled. Uh, we did a, a tribute right after the uh, news of his diagnosis. People would send in these wonderful clips, these video clips that they had recorded at home with their webcams, encouraging him, you know, that if anybody can beat this, you can. Just give it the hitch slap. <laughs> and uh, And it was... Encouraging, not just for, I know Christopher Hitchens had a chance to, to see the video and I had received a short reply from him thanking me. And of course, that meant the world. But I mean, it just seemed to sort of encourage everybody. Yeah, he's got this. Yeah, he's got this. Even as we saw him deteriorate. I believe uh, one of his last public appearances was at the Texas Free Thought Convention. We saw him looking so gaunt and frail. And still we thought, you know, he'll beat this. And then the news yesterday that Christopher Hitchens died. It seemed shocking, even though it had already sort of seemed inevitable at the same time. It's this weird contradiction going on. I myself, as a video producer, I was thinking, you know, a lot of organizations who do media or news will prepare the obituaries of famous people long before they pass away. And then they will keep those often for years in archive. They'll develop the graphics and they'll do the research on on the celebrity's life, celebrity for lack of a better word, they'll uh, they'll have it ready. They'll have already scoured uh, all of their resources for the photos, for the videos, for the interviews, for the sound bites. And and I I tried, <laughs> I just couldn't do it. Months ago, you know, I I just even as I saw him deteriorate, I I could not do it. I it's difficult to describe. But it felt like by creating his obituary, it was like vocally ticking down the hours of his life. I, it felt almost like a betrayal. Anyone Can anyone relate to that? You know what I'm talking about? So I, I hadn't done any video tribute at all. None. I had nothing prepared. Maybe that was my way of saying, oh, yeah, he's going to beat this. He's, gonna, he's got this. And then the headline comes in. And the world is shocked. And I um, rushed into the editing room and, and put together a piece that, that is just my own contribution to so many wonderful Christopher Hitchens tribute videos out there. You can find it on my YouTube page. We've taken just his voice, his face, images of him through the years. And, and I wanted it to be a little less funereal. I wanted it to be really something that was more about a charge to the rest of us who remain. I think that people have been encouraged by Christopher Hitchens and his work and his life and his writings and his courage. And I think I really wanted the video to be more of a, um, I don't know, like a reminder to the rest of us that the the game continues. We are, we're not even close and somebody has got to carry the torch. This show will be about anecdotes and stories and about, uh, the ways that Christopher Hitchens' life and work has impacted your life. Just browsing the comments pages, it's been amazing. People saying the most wonderful things and others. <laughs> I am amazed at how some people use any opportunity as a platform or soapbox. We had this happen back when the first news of the diagnosis had come in. You'd see someone say, go, go get him, Hitch. You got this, Hitch. You know, We're rooting for you, Hitch. Take courage, Hitch. And then there'd be some Some idiot who'd pop in and say, well, I didn't agree with Hitch about this, 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 and this, 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 and this. And he was a complete douchebag. But I wish you the best. I mean, is that the most appropriate venue? (laughs) You know, you have to throw out, oh, yeah, he and I were way apart about everything. And I hated his guts, but I sure don't want him to die. Well, I've had a few of those people, obviously. They're going to pop up anywhere. I've had some believers pop in. 
Uh, I haven't seen too much in the way of gloating. You know, that's what I was afraid of if someone would say, well, he sure does know the truth now, now that he's burning in hell. Um, you know, those people do exist. It is a very unfortunate. Most of what I've seen have been people who said, you know, I'm a believer, and yet I still am saddened by this news. And I, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that these people see what is a, a human experience the life and loss of someone cherished by so many, whether you agreed or disagreed. The guy just freaking challenged you. He was one of the first who challenged me. And as we share anecdotes uh, on this show over the next hour, I just figured I'd start with mine. And you'll see the number on the switchboard if you would like to call in and uh, talk about how his life and work influenced you, if you have a different take on things. I mean, whatever. Uh, I was in my late 30s, mid uh, uh, let me say, I, I really started to sort of check out of religion in my early 30s. Uh, when you are deeply embedded in a faith, quite often, and this has been my experience, is when nothing makes sense, what you do is you just kind of sort of recuse yourself. You know, you stop invoking God. You you don't go to church. You don't read the Bible. What you do is if anyone asks you if you believe in God, you go, oh, yeah, sure, I believe in God. But you don't live your life as if you do. You just sort of check out of the game. You remain on the sidelines because you're tired of making all of the square pegs fit into a round hole. And that's what had happened to me uh, through a large, large part of my 30s. It's very comfortable and very convenient to be able to say, oh, of course I'm a Christian. Of course I believe in God, right? Because you've got eternal security, because you've got the security of knowing that you're still in the faith. But you're not a practicing believer, it's, a, it's this nice, safe zone. Well, I don't have to worry about talking to the sky as much, but we'll pray at meals occasionally, and I'll invoke God. And if anyone asks me, you betcha, I'm a public testament. Well, as the years go on, and I think this happens as you get older, <laughs> your BS meter goes off a whole lot faster and a whole lot louder. And you become less and less tolerant with the things in this world that do not make sense. And, and as I approached middle age... At high speed, uh, I, uh, I found myself not satisfied to just go, oh, well, whatever. Oh, whatever. I mean, the more I heard, the more I read, the more I felt, the more I thought, I've got to try to figure this out. And I became hungry for answers. Now, I didn't know much about Christopher Hitchens. I had seen him on uh, TV shows from time to time, usually as some sort of a political pundit, right? They'd bring him on and they would talk about whatever the uh, the – the political topic was of the day, you know, were we fighting a war? What was this government doing? What's the economy doing? What's this? What's that? And, and you know, he was always erudite. He was always very impressive. He always seemed to, like he just walked in the room and he was smarter than everybody else, right? But I didn't really know much about him, and I certainly didn't follow him. There's something about him I kind of liked, um, but I couldn't really relate to. I was still a believer at the time. And uh, back in, like, uh, 2004, I guess it was 2004, 2005, Dennis Miller, who I'm a fan of Dennis Miller, had a, a talk show on CNBC. And um, he used to have Christopher Hitchens on the talk show. And they would just sit there and just and just talk. And um, Hitchens, you know how he is. He's just, he's just cool and kind of cocky and calm. And he's got that, you know, that voice. And... Uh, most of the panel topics didn't really interest me all that much, but there was just something about the way the guy carried himself. I did watch a little bit, but I never took I never took Hitchens really personally, right? Well, fast forward. It's like, I don't know, it was like 2008. Uh, Christopher Hitchens' uh, book, he had the book, The Portable Atheist, was already you know pushing everybody's buttons, right? Raising the hackles of, of people all over the, the world. And it piqued my curiosity. Now, I'd been kind of tiptoeing around for, for years, and I finally found a clip. There was a, a, a debate on YouTube between Christopher Hitchens and Rabbi – I hope I, I never say his name right – Rabbi Shmuley Botiech. Is that how you say it? Uh, it happened um, over at New York's 92nd Street Y, this big auditorium, packed house. In January of 2008. Now, I'm not Jewish, people. I'm a corn-fed, Midwestern, redneck, Protestant Christian. And I'm not, I wasn't a defender of Jewish teachings or tradition, right? But I was figuring, well, there's Hitchens behind the debate podium. There's a rabbi. And if anybody can defend scripture and religion, it's going to be, the, it's going to be uh, Shmuley, right? He's got it. And I'm, I watched the debate. 
I mean, and I did some research on uh, on the rabbi after the fact, and I guess he's the real deal. I guess he's uh, Newsweek said he was the most famous rabbi in America. He's this author, and he has TV appearances everywhere, and he's an expert, expert, right? I'd never seen anything quite like it, so I'm sitting in the office. I'm doing some graphics work, and I just play the debate, minimize the window, and keep it on, and and watch Christopher Hitchens versus Rabbi Shmuley Botiach. And I thought, well, this ought to be pretty good. And those of us who have seen Hitchens in the debate arena now are familiar with the hitch slap, and that is exactly what happened. Now, the rabbi was smooth, right? He was a car salesman. I mean, the guy was very... I mean, he, he spoke with poetry and he spoke with feeling and he, you know, he used his voice like an instrument and he was he was totally playing to the crowd. And Hitch just sort of sat there. Now, I'm not saying Hitch never raised his voice, but it was unbelievable to me that the rabbi was unable to really properly defend the scriptures. And he throws out the, the obligatory Hitler reference, which is the huge hot button that drives everybody crazy. Um, he spends a whole lot of time just nitpicking at Hitch's book. And in the meantime, I found myself thinking, God, Christopher Hitchens is fearless. And it made me a little bit uncomfortable, right? You don't talk out against God. You don't speak like – you don't talk like that about God. Lightning strikes from the sky, you know? You wake up the next morning and you're covered in, in boils. <laughs> you don't do it. Fearless. I, I, I mean I knew the guy was – I knew the guy was fear-free when it came to what he believed in, but I had never seen that kind of a brash overt challenge to the almighty creator of the universe. And uh, then it became like watching, uh, I mean, I, I was, I didn't know that I agreed. I was still kind of shocked. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I cannot believe this guy. So I scoured YouTube. I found every – I mean, the guy debated a bunch of people. The guy debated all over the place, as I'm sure you know. I watched – almost. I think I've watched just about every one of them now. And what happened was is time and time and time again, the more I watched, the more I realized that this man is making sense. And that's a scary moment. Because now you're looking back on 30-some years of life. And the teachings of your youth and a religious school and a and a, a Protestant church and mealtime prayers and bedtime prayers and memory verses and talks about God and Satan and the afterlife and heaven and hell. And you're thinking, wait a minute, hang on, hang on, hang on. That's a scary, scary moment for someone who's been doing it their whole life. But I noticed that, you know, his arguments were more solid, more well-founded, more researched, more convincing. Christopher Hitchens' arguments are more convincing. And I uh, pinballed from those debates to others by... Uh, by speeches, rather, by Dawkins, and I discovered Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett and many, many others. And I uh, began to read Hitchens' work and his books and whatnot, his articles. And it sounds cliche, and, and I know that people have a tendency to deify someone after they have gone, right? And I don't want that to be how this comes across. But there were just a few critical people at the moment where I started to make the turn who snapped their fingers six inches in front of my face and said, think about it. And for me, I mean, Christopher Hitchens was the guy. It was that one debate between him and the rabbi. And it's, I think, 90 minutes on YouTube. You can find it. You can just Google search it or YouTube search it. You can find it. It'll frustrate you. It'll make you laugh. It'll engage you. And you will see exactly what I'm talking about. I credit the work and the life and the words and the courage and, and, the, and the, the ability to walk into a room and be amazingly courteous and at the same time 
just mock the hell out of, out of whatever was mock worthy at the time to Christopher Hitchens. I've never seen anything like it. I believe with all my heart we will not see anything like it again in our lifetimes at the very least. And while there are many people remaining who will champion free thought and common sense and skepticism, I just don't see anybody on our radar who does it the way Hitch did. And it it leaves a huge void. It leaves a huge hole. I would have loved the opportunity to be able to just once meet him at a convention or something, go shake his hand. I'm sure he, he, he would have heard it 50 times a day, would never even remembered my name. Just go shake his hand and say, thank you. Thank you. You helped me take ownership of my own life instead of inheriting what someone else believed or wanted to believe. Instead of trying to make sense of what was, well, what didn't make sense. You made me uncomfortable. You made me really uncomfortable, and I want to thank you. I see several people on the switchboard. I've taken enough of our time, so let me go and talk to some people who are in our our uh, chat room and on the switchboard about their own uh, memories, about their own perspectives on Hitch's life and death. If you would like to be a part of the show, you will see the number on the top of the screen. Area code 717. Thank you so much for calling the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's your name? Tracy. Hi, Tracy. I'm so glad you waited. Thanks for calling the show. I wish you was under better circumstances. What did you have to, uh, to share with us today? Well, I first wanted to um, get your uh, well, get, I wanted to get your take on basically debating with CS whether or not it's productive. You've sort of you sort of answered that already. By the way, you might remember me. I'm the one who called into your um, one on the cults indoctrination. I remember you, Tracy. Okay. Yeah. And, and um, anyways. I, Fantastic! I'm so glad I got to, got to go on that one because I've made so many friends off that show and among different atheists. It's really made uh, made life so much easier to have other people to talk to since then. Um, I'd say that from these main influences that led me from evangelical Christianity to you know to atheism were Hitchens, Dawkins, and then that Nova documentary on the Denver schools. Intelligent design, if you remember that one. I do. In yeah. fact, I encourage our people to Google search that one. Um, I okay. have it. I have it saved in my favorites on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. If you can't find it outright, it's about, oh, I think okay. it's about ninety minutes, and it talks about the yeah the infiltration of creation teaching into into the school system and the big fight over it. So yeah, no, and, and, and those I'd say those were the three questions for me of you know of my transfer from theism to atheism, and I think that there were a lot of people recently, or at least a few people leaving the Thinking Atheist page on Facebook. You know, you're concentrating too much on arguing or debating theists. It's pointless. I'll never listen to reason. You know, it's been it's been real, but bye. And um, I, I you know I, I listen to these people and I get frustrated because I'm thinking if people had all taken that attitude, I wouldn't be an atheist now. I mean, it might be, but I certainly wouldn't have you know have had the the opportunity to hear the other side of it. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, what's your take? How how do you how do you recommend that people approach theists, and in, you know what type of discussion is productive. Obviously, saying you know you're full of shit, <laughs> and uh, you know, and you're stupid is never not really going to work because you've got to appeal to a person's ego. Well, some of the time, Hitch obviously didn't always do that, but you know, he, then again, he was never bashing on me personally, straight to my face. So that's probably why I could hear him. Uh, but yeah, how do you how do you recommend people approach a theist? Well. Because the show is about Christopher Hitchens, let me just tell you how his debate helped me and how I believe others perceive it. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what I'm asking is because you know, people say, oh, oh, you shouldn't. And I'm like, well, you know, look, we're celebrating Hitch. This guy obviously did and did it effectively, and he wasn't, you know, and he was. Well, when his book know, came I, I out, right? I think he'd hate us. He'd hate us to stop and say, when, oh, it's when, pointless. When God is Not Great came out and he was doing uh, the book tour, he, he said, look, I want to go – through the Bible Belt. He didn't say, take me to all the most secular heathen cities just there. You know, don't just take me. He said, I want to go to the south in, in the United States 
and and the guy everywhere he pitched a tent, he would debate whenever and whoever and whatever. I mean, he was absolutely con- convinced and fearless, and I respect that about him. Here's what happened with the hitch debate with the rabbi, is that as he was debating, he wasn't debating me. He was debating the rabbi, but I was watching in the wings. I was a sponge. Right. I was absorbing information because good information leads, I believe, hopefully to good decisions. And I think that's what happens sometimes when you and I debate. Uh, if I'm debating someone who is a theist and I can tell they've got that mannequin smile on their face, they're they're right. sending, they're not receiving, they are not debating, it is not an exchange, they're simply going to give you their position, they're not interested in changing their mind. In fact, they'll actually tell you, it doesn't matter what evidence you give me, doesn't matter what, what you say, I'll never give up my faith. Well, what they've just said is, my mind is closed, and it... it, right. it if uh, uh, you know Thor showed up today and said and parted the skies and, and conducted miracles and said Jesus was not real, I'd still believe in Jesus. Well, you're wasting <laughs> right. your time with them. But as you debate them, and you see the foundation of the arguments that they have beginning to crumble underneath their feet, the world is watching. I mean, your community is watching. Your friends and family are watching, and they see it happen. Now they're making a judgment call onto which ar- which argument was the most critical. And credi- critical and credible. And I think that is where debate becomes effective. You know, Hitch goes out. Did he change Al Sharpton's mind whenever he debated Sharpton? Hell no. Did he change <laughs> the rabbi's mind? No. You know, William Lane Craig or any of those people, he's not changing their mind. But, I mean, think of all the people who found that debate or watched in the audience or saw it on YouTube or listened to it in a podcast or wherever – who may have been on the fence one way or the other, and they needed to hear both perspectives presented by credible, supposedly credible sources so that they could make the decision. I think debate is, in that context, always a good thing. And uh, there were a few as good at it as Christopher Hitchens was. He's going to be sorely missed in the debate arena. I, I, I can't, it's hard to describe how Christopher made me feel empowered and strong and Stupid, all at the same time. <laughs> you know, no, I know exactly he, what you mean. If <laughs> you draw the information out of, if you draw the water from the well, he would make these references and just an encyclopedia of information. And I would look, at, I would watch, and I would say, "I'm stupid. <laughs> How does he do it? How is this possible?" And, and at the uh, same time, you're sitting there as his cheerleader, going, "Go get him, get him, Hitch." Yeah, and I'm thinking, and when it's over, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go out and tell somebody today there is no God. You know, I'm just going to go out and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to debate somebody. It's a weird paradox there, but um, I'm glad that he has been a positive influence on on your life. He has, would you say? Oh, absolutely. And I'd, I'd say that um, among people that I've met who have, you know, who are willing to consider the possibility that maybe Christianity. Yeah, is isn't um is real people who don't yet have the mannequin face on or are willing to take it off. I'd say, you know, he definitely is a voice of uh, you know, a voice that hits I think he that snaps the finger right in your face and will hopefully be able to wake you up. So and the uh, good and news about me, it gives me encouragement that it's worth you know, I've had a lot of theists come out on my page in the last few days and just you know, the last couple of days I had nasty things to say, you know, kinda of the, the things you were saying, oh like, well, he's in hell now. And it's been so hard to hold back. I mean, it's sort of been that, that struggle. Do we answer? Do we not? Yeah. Um, but I think your point is true, that even if they aren't listening, others in the wings are watching. Yeah. Tracy, I appreciate your call. Thank you for uh, for being a part of the show today. I wish you all the best for the new year, okay? All right. Thank you very much. You too. Take care. I had uh, someone comment on the uh, – I made a mention of Hitch on my own page, and, and, he's, and the guy's got a great heart. But he said something like, um, I hope Hitch was pleasantly surprised. And he's a he's a believer, my buddy. And I, I was trying to sort of understand what he meant. Like, is, is that an inference that hope he wasn't unpleasantly surprised? <laughs> or was that a genuine you know, piece of goodwill in, in what was a, a tremendous, tremendous loss? Area code, uh, I I've, I see a whole slew of numbers here, but I'll say 447. Hi, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Hello, Seth. Can you hear me? I can hear you. 
What's up? Um, hello. Uh, my name's Steph. I'm from the UK, where Christopher Hitchens came from originally. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you ever so much for creating this forum where we can all remember and honour the life of Christopher Hitchens. What you've done today is so important for, all, for us all to come together and just talk about him and celebrate his life and what he did for the cause, which was undeniably greater than anyone else could ever do, to be fair. I'll keep this short and sweet because I can appreciate you've got other people wanting to talk to you. But what I wanted to say was I appreciate and thank Christopher Hitchens for what he does and what he did, to be fair. I still can't believe he's gone. I thought he'd live on forever and this thing he would be. But, you know... Um, he had such a way with words when when I was reading his books, and I still read them to this day. It's, the way that he has with words was so poetic and so clever that I don't think anyone else but him could string those words together. And I believe that he would even make an apologist acrobat shut up in the end, which is quite a feat. So, <laughs> yeah, he... um. There'll be no one else like him, I think. We've got to take up his mantle now, you know, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, everyone else together. Take up his torch and carry on where he left off so that he won't be forgotten and everything that he said won't have been in vain. I think, Steph, that I sort of learned a lesson about how I... This sounds really cliche. I don't want it to come off corny, okay? But I, I really do mean it. Yeah. I think about if if it was my life and I had been given a diagnosis of what was mm -hmm. almost assuredly a death sentence, you have a 97, what, 97% 97 chance of this being a, a, a fatal diagnosis. Yeah. I, I would like to live the remainder of my life. I mean, he, did you notice that he he went in and did the chemo and he did all those things that, that all these yeah. radical treatments to try to, to – but he didn't stop. You know, he no. was still on the lecture circuit and, and his, his life, his face – you know, his his countenance all became kind of a roadmap of yeah. where he was at in his treatment at the time. But the guy never sat back in the in the easy chair and said, well, I'm just going to, you know, I'm done. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what I would hope for for both of us is that if you yeah. know, we all know we're on this blip for, for a very short time anyway on this rock. Yeah. But if we know it might be even shorter, it's even more critical to, man, get make a difference, get yourself out there, do what you can, even if there's a huge physical cost. I mean, the guy literally was deteriorating in front of our eyes, and yet you saw the light in his eye, you saw the smile, you saw the incredible Passion. amount of confidence he had, you know? Yeah. But the the thing is there, I mean, that is to be greatly admired and respected, that even though he had this debilitating disease, I mean, just to speak out publicly and say that you're an atheist and debate against the theists is hard enough. And it went on to possibly most a difficult level when it came to him with the double whammy of having to debate with the theist, which can take a lot out of you at times, but also as well have to fight this debilitating disease as well. I think that kind of strength has to draw admiration for us all and the respect that he deserves. I wish, you, I wish you the very best for the new year, and I'm glad, uh, so glad you're part of the show. And and his, his work, his life, his influence continues on with, through all the rest of us. So I think it's more of a charge to all of us. We just need to shore it up. You know, we lost we lost one, but it ain't over. So, Steph, I, yeah. I appreciate you very, very much. We've lost one, but we've gained many. Love it. Take care of yourself, girl. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. You know, that's probably a um, a good thing to to remember is that a lot of people are like, oh, there'll never be another hitch. And they're right. There'll never be another. But just because there won't be someone who does what he did exactly the way he did it, with the flair <laughs> that he did it, it doesn't mean that the rest of us go, oh, geez, you know, the whole the whole cause is, you know, is uh, now impotent. Uh, it means the charge is on the rest of us to try to uh, shore things up. And I honestly believe that we are in a time and Christopher Hitchens' work and life were a big part of it, where in America, the culture is beginning to change. You know, it, he, 
I remember Dawkins would talk about the word atheist and why do you use it? It's such a polarizing word. And and Richard Dawkins said, it's, it's because it's polarizing that I use it. I want to go out and make this word so commonplace, so acceptable that it just, it's, it just is what it is. It, I'm an atheist. And the freaking Hitchens was even more so, you know. He titled a book, God is Not Great, <laughs> How Religion Poisons Everything. Uh, wow. And, uh, you know, these, this, this trail being blazed is going to, in my, my deepest hopes, make things better for the generations that come after here in America. Area code 414, thank you so much for calling this show. Who's this? Hi, Seth. This is Wayne uh, from the Evolution of an Atheist. I'm glad you're here. What's going on, Wayne? Uh, no, I just wanted to let you know that uh, it was it was I one time uh, was a theist as well. I was brought up in a Catholic religion, and uh, I think your last, um, the one before this, uh, Tracy, she mm-hmm. said that you know what's what's the point of having this argument, you know, with theists and such. And the point is this: people like Hitchens, self, people like Richard Dawkins, uh, have opened my eyes. Uh, they opened my eyes to a world that. Uh, I could have never imagined without people like you, um, the voice of reason. Um, so for that, Hitchens specifically uh, has opened my eyes to to a world that I would have never viewed if I wouldn't have taken those rose-colored glasses off. You know. What was your uh, background? Were you uh, Protestant? Were you Catholic? Were you? I mean, where were you? I, I was a Catholic. Um, I grew up in a Catholic household. Uh, grew up, um, you know, being uh, lectured. The Bible daily. Um, even now, my wife and uh, her family are very Catholic. And during Christmas time, during any time I go over there, uh, the discussion of religion and God always comes up. Um, were you raised though in a culture where you were a little bit or a lot scared to ever challenge God? I mean, where there were so many sacred cows, and they're like, "Well, you don't test God, you don't tempt God, you don't mock God." I mean, was that the culture you were in? Oh, absolutely. Um, it was just commonplace for me to uh, worship God, pray to God, um, and just follow the herd, basically. You know. So then you see somebody like Hitchens, <laughs> who who oh, yeah. mocks with glee, and you oh, think, <laughs> and is combative and good at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, Did that empower yeah. you, though? I mean, you you see somebody like that. And yeah. does that does that help shore you up internally to go out and do battle in your own circle or at least know your own mind? I mean, how did it affect oh, absolutely. you? Absolutely. Absolutely. It affected me in such a way that it gave me the tools, uh, gave me the confidence that I needed to, to stand up and uh and tell people, listen, uh these um these uh things that don't make sense to us in the real world. We have science, we have uh, rational people that are viewing this world in a different way and what you're saying doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't go according to the laws of physics, according to the laws of, of, of how this world was, was really made. And, and people like Hitchens really, I don't know, really touched me in that aspect, especially his book, God Is Not Great, was just amazing. Um, so, yeah, and people like yourself as well, uh, Seth, have also empowered me with, with your website. The community that you've, communi- uh, that you've created has also made me create a community to also embrace people and, and try and show them the light. If you want to put a bad cliche to it. Well, you're very kind. Honestly, I, you know, I'm just a redneck with flashy toys. I mean, I look at somebody like Rich, uh, Richard Dawkins or Hitchens or Dan Dennett, and then I, I realize that I'm I'm at the kid's table, uh, you know, and I'm happy to. Honestly, I mean, these these people are have, a, have an intellect. They had a, a, They were forces of nature. I think that it, it will be difficult to ever equal. But um, uh, I think to myself that, you know, if, if I can – if I can take the influence that Christopher Hitchens has had on my life and help translate it into an encouragement to someone else, that would be something certainly worth celebrating. I appreciate you being a part of the show today, and thanks for helping us remember the Hitch, okay? Well, thank you much, Seth. Take care. Bye. Speaking of the sacred cows, Mother Teresa, I was raised, I, I didn't know anything about the woman, which is typical of how religion works, by the way. Right? I don't know anything about her. She's Mother Teresa. I mean, you know, she's Mother Teresa. She is saintly. She is someone to be honored, embraced, 
and celebrated. We would see Mother Teresa. We would see her on the television, and she would be walking around in these very poor rags. She would be helping the needy and the poor. Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa became something you would, I don't know, it was like a description you would use to describe someone saintly. Oh, geez, she's a regular Mother Teresa. Never occurred to me to criticize the woman. So then I hear Christopher Hitchens speak about her. In fact, he did a, a, a television special. He did. He's written several articles on her. He's been interviewed on I don't know how many news shows about her, and, and I'm, you're going to have to probably YouTube or Google those because there are just too many, uh, and I didn't bring a list with me. But I do have a quote here. I mean, Mother Teresa. In Slate, October 2003, a quote from Christopher Hitchens, Mother Teresa was not a friend of the poor. She was a friend of poverty. She said that suffering was a gift from God. She spent her life opposing the only known cure for poverty, which is the empowerment of women and the emancipation of them from a livestock version of compulsory reproduction. Holy crap. We just insult Mother Teresa? Talk about fearlessness. Now, I didn't buy it at first. I'm like, oh, yeah, come on, it's Mother Teresa. But as most things that we take for granted that become cliché, that we just, we take, a, it's like Pez, information's like Pez, those little candies, you just take a little, you know, take a bite and move on, right? It's exactly what it was like with Mother Teresa. And I became fascinated to see that in her life, so much of what she did actually added to the problem of poverty. Mother Teresa, if it hadn't been for Christopher Hitchens, I wouldn't have known that. Provocative to the very end, one of his most famous quotes was in the New Yorker 2006. He said, the, most, the four most overrated things in life are champagne, lobster, anal sex, and picnics. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I doubt you'll see that on the, uh, on the billboard. <laughs> you might. I don't know. Uh, let's go back to the switchboard and talk to... Uh, is it Elda, E-L-D-A? Hi, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Christopher Hitchens, uh, he allowed me to realize that it's okay to be an atheist, you know? Uh, I saw his videos on, uh, on, on YouTube, and, uh, and after that it was Sam Harris and uh, Richard Dawkins. And then it was, well, then it was the Thinking Atheist, and uh, that really got me into, uh, you know, being the atheist I always wanted to be. <laughs> Well, I'm uh, glad he's influenced your, your life, and, and um, do you have any th thoughts on his passing, how you felt when you heard the news, anything that, any any way that you think he's made your particular stand or or, or mindset better, any reflections on Christopher Hitchens? Well, for me, the, the, he seemed like the smartest man on earth, he knew absolutely everything, so I actually don't really know what to say. When I, when I heard he was dead, I was at work, and, and uh, well, I just really felt sad, you know, and uh, I was just... That guy was great. He had so many great arguments. He he, he even helped me. Uh, he re truly helped me um, uh, uh, discuss properly, you know, with uh, with with uh, people um, uh, who are religious. I always found it really well, kind of hard, you know, because my emotions can take over. I think we all know how that goes. And he uh, he got those perfect arguments, and he really helped. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate your call. Thank you so much for being a part yeah. of the show today. Hey, Seth, and thank you, man. Finally, I can thank you uh, in person. So. Oh, it's my pleasure. Honestly, it's an honor to speak with you. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Goodbye. I love getting calls from all over the world, uh, from people who uh, enjoy and participate in the, in the community of the thinking atheist. It's just a tremendously gratifying feeling. The... Um, I just totally lost my train of thought. I was going to say something about. Oh, well, I was hoping that uh, that in the wake of Christopher Hitchens' death, that it might cause a resurgence in interest in his work, in words, in his videos, and and uh, you know, you go into a Google search and and Christopher Hitchens, you know, is appearing more and more as articles appear all around the world. You know, 
it is my hope that in this hour, you know, on the uh, the day after the news of his death has broken, that people who may not have engaged before, maybe they knew about him and only in a tertiary way, would then maybe engage. What if they stumble upon the, the YouTube debate? What if they stumble upon a Vanity Fair article? What if they pick up a copy of his book because they're curious? You know, they realize, geez, what's all the fuss about? What's, wow, look at this big outpouring of support and all the people who are grieving. And yes, grieving is important. I've had a few people say, you know, there's no need to grieve. It's pointless for us to grieve. It's pointless for people to feel any way about this. And I see that from time to time when when something happens that evokes an emotional response. And I always resist because I believe we as human beings are not just a mind. Uh, we are emotional creatures. We are relational creatures. We do have feelings. And I, while I, I don't think a life should be lived uh, with the emotions as your compass, you know, that, that shouldn't be the beginning and the end, that you shouldn't make your decisions based on how you feel. That's completely unreliable. I do believe that feelings are not something that should be eschewed or, or, or uh, done away with or ignored or, or um, minimized, marginalized. We're emotional creatures. We feel. When I heard the news, when you heard the news, you felt and people send me messages and said that they, they wept. I mean, they physically wept. They didn't know Christopher Hitchens personally, but they felt a profound sense of loss, and the tears came. They needed those tears. That's a legitimate response, people. We're human beings. I had kind of a knot in my gut. I just thought, God, I can't believe he's gone. I can't believe. And then I felt immediately grat grateful that I was alive in the time when Christopher Hitchens had done so much. I was there, you know, as they called him, one of the new atheists. He was one of the four horsemen. I was there when YouTube took off, you know, YouTube that began just a few short years ago. My real introduction to Christopher Hitchens, I was born at just the right time. When his books would be available worldwide and I was able to get them for you know, just a few bucks to be able to peruse the information, to know a little bit more about his mind, to get another perspective, agree, disagree, whatever. And people disagreed all the time. People disagreed with Hitch about the Iraq war. And you have to admire the guy's conviction. He stood against the tide and he stood for his guns. He supported wh whether you do or not. I mean, he wasn't going to fold just because of popular opinion. He had a conviction and stuck by it. I admire that. I respect it. But don't cheat yourself out of the uh, out of the opportunity to feel something about all of this. We're not robots, you know. We're not we're not robots. We're not these cerebral creatures that sit around and look down our noses at the rest of the world. We feel. Sometimes it's good to acknowledge that. Eight six zero. Hi. Thanks for calling the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Hey, hey, Seth. This is uh, Gary from Connecticut. How you doing? Glad you called, Gary. Thanks for being a part of the show. What's up? Um, you used words that uh, really resonate, that uh, he was uh, fearless and, uh, well, he had that flair. And uh, I know that they say he's the only one of his kind and there'll never be another, but I, I hope there will be someone who is fearless and has flair to kind of lead the movement because he was so in your face to the theists, and uh, I don't know that any of the other so-called four horsemen uh, are so in your face. Uh, it's like we're taught to have deference. We can argue with the theists, but you know we're supposed to defer to them or we're supposed to respect them. But uh, I guess uh, Hitch uh, didn't show them that deference, and I hope someone else emerges who has that same kind of delivery. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on that kind of aspect of him? Well, I mean, I see Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins as pretty fearless. Um, I mean, I, I see those guys as on, on the front lines, but I, I know what you're talking about. There's something different about the way Hitch did it. And again, it sounds cliche. It sounds like I'm trying to deify the man after the, his, you know, after his death. And, and those who have seen or are familiar with Hitch's work know exactly what I'm talking about. He sits in the chair, right? He's in the debate chair. He's on the stage. And if he's sitting next to Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Dan Barker, or whoever, right? There's something about the way that he has a wink in his eye. He has a tone in his voice. There's something about the way he delivered it that there was almost a glee 
about the way he was able to dismantle and then decimate a theist argument. He was passionate. Uh, and I, I think there is an element of that that lacks a little bit for me. In, and I'm a huge admirer of Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris. They're, they're tremendous, tremendous champions. But there's something extra that, that Hitchens had that I think the movement really does need. And I don't know. I can't, it's difficult to quantify into words. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? I mean, am I making any sense? <laughs> well, the, fa- the fact, Seth, that they have this the great word that someone must have come up with on YouTube, the hitch slap. The hitch slap. It really sums up the fact that he was the one who could deliver a hitch slap. And well, while the others are, are wonderful speakers, uh, none of them could deliver a hitch slap. Something about the tonal quality of his voice and the way he carried himself, the way he squared himself behind the podium, the way he was able to um, to use humor. And I'll tell you something. There is a there are a few things as uncomfortable as someone who doesn't know how to use humor well, trying to use humor in front of an audience. And trust me, if you watch any kind of geeky science type debate, anything that deals with philosophy and science and, and a lot of these other things, evolutionary biology, you will find these these things where, where the punchlines fall flat. With with Hitchens, as he talks about the world and politics and religion and history and all the things that he did, and he threw a zinger out, he owned it. He owned the crowd. And, and I think that's something desperately needed. And it is my hope, honestly, is this tide of non-belief, the skepticism of atheism, at least here in the United States, if not around the world, continues to grow, that it will make it easier for other people who may have that ability to maybe come forward and not step into the, to his shoes, but maybe you know help to fill the void in some way. Or maybe it'll be you, Seth. I don't no. know if you ever got my no. email, that, but I've offered the free voiceover work if, uh, if you ever need it for uh, um, some of your videos to help you with to defray the costs. I don't know if you ever got my email. I sent it to the editor. Thank you very kind. So, uh, uh, I myself, I, it will not be me, and I'll tell you why. I, I, I feel like you must know your strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I, I, I know what I'm good at, and I know what I'm terrible at. Um, you know, I mean, I can communicate, I can translate a story, I can produce video, I can produce audio. But as far as coming even close to the depth and breadth of what uh, people like Hitchens and Dawkins and whatnot bring to the argument, uh, I myself know that I that is not my role. I, I would not be good at it. I would be well, I- horribly ill qualified to do it. But I tell you what, I sure would like to see someone else enter that enter that fray so that I could then go back and maybe support what they do, you know. And um, there's a huge hole, and it is my hope that the rest of us, all of us, can help somehow go through and, and pick up the pieces and fill it. Appreciate your call, brother. Take care of yourself, okay? All right. Thanks for the set slaps. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Let's do one more. Area code 425. Hi. Thanks for uh, calling the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's up? Hey, what's up, man? First of all, I just wanted to say I love your work. I follow your channel a lot. Um, and I just wanted to share a, uh, a story of an interaction I had with Christopher Hitchens. You met him? Uh, no, but um, I'm currently going to college, and uh, I emailed him uh, when I found out that he had cancer because um, me and all my friends were just, you know, really broken up about that. So I sent him an email. Um, and if I may, I'd like to read his response. It's only only a couple sentences, but it's direct from the hitch. So. Oh, please do. Okay, so I emailed him, and I said, you know, I, I, I love you. You're, you're a big influence on my life and everything. And I said, keep soldiering on with the cause. And uh, he said, dear Mr. Blank, that's very kind and considerate of you. I feel sure you would have emancipated yourself in any case, but I'm honored to think you might, I might have been of help. Be careful about role models. I want you to be able to criticize my writing as well. Sincerely, Christopher H. That was his response to me. And so. Well, I can see why you saved it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just thought, you know, I would share that he, he does answer everyone's emails and, uh, you know, he's just a stand-up guy and he's stuck, stuck true to his principles about, you know, not having role models because I, I actually called him a role model in my email. And, you know, he's such a contrarian that he, he came back at me and said, now, now, you know, no role models. So. Well, I, I'm glad you called and I'm, I'm sure that's something you'll probably keep with you forever. Take care of yourself, okay? All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their calls and for being a part of the show today. Ultimately, I want to to encourage you to do this. Um, this, Again, 
when you are speaking in the context of someone's death, it is so easy to fall into parody and cliche. It is the very last thing I want. But if Christopher Hitchens was listening to this particular show or reading the eulogies or watching the news, we think he'd say. I mean, I'm sure he would want to be remembered. And there are those who say, ah, oh, he wouldn't care. No, no, no. I'm sure he would want to be remembered. He would want to know that he was missed. We Wouldn't we all as human beings? I also think he'd be like, get off your ass. Get up. Speak out. Do something. Be something. Don't sit this one out. I, he would, I think he would be thinking, all right, now what? Sure, I'm gone. All right, fine. Who's going to shore it up? Who's going to who's going to jump in? You know, who's gonna, you know the, the the baton needs to be passed to somebody. People, even if it's a community of people, what will come of my death? What positive thing can you bring out of it? I mean, that's what I think he would say. Don't, don't sit don't sit on your hands. Don't sit around all day thinking, oh, this sucks. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. While he would want to be remembered and he would want to be missed, I think honestly he would be like, all right, come on. Life is too short. Well, but I'm paraphrasing the quote that where he said there'd be plenty of time for silence in the grave. And I included that quote in my own tribute video, which you can find on my YouTube channel. There'd be plenty of time for silence in the grave. Absolutely. Forgive the poor quality of this audio recording. But Christopher Hitchens recently spoke about the afterlife. It's about four minutes, and I felt like it would be the most appropriate way to close the show as we listen to the words and the voice of Hitch himself. Here's the problem with um, the afterlife fantasy. It's the same as religion in general. Uh, oh, if you can't hear, I hope it's not my fault. <laughs> that. Okay. Not to duck the opening question, give myself a chance to repeat my answer. Um, that would mean that anything that made you feel good or better was fine, which I think is a contemptible position, I'm sorry to say. And it would, it would be as good as, as the drugs, for example. And I don't believe, and in fact Marx never said, that religion is just an opiate. But religion and the afterlife fantasy have these things in common. First, they're man-made. That's very important. Uh, they, they represent claims by humans to be able to interpret the divine and to give themselves power by doing so. We all, we all admit we don't know. That's because we can't know. So the people who have to leave the island right away are those who say they do, who for centuries have tyrannized and still do millions of human beings by claiming to hold the keys of heaven and hell. Leading to my second point, religion is totalitarian in its practice and its theory. It claims to know things it can't know, and it claims to have powers it cannot have. It says if you make the right propitiations and the right donations, you may get paradise, and if you, if you don't, you may get an eternity of pain. That includes, by the way, the souls of unbaptized children of the millions uh, who Sam mentioned. Um, then there's, I'm afraid to say, the, but you also, as you'd expect from the man, made the argument of fraud. Um, St. Peter's in Rome was built on the sale of indulgences. That's to say, in return for cash, the promise of a remission of sin and of time in hell or purgatory. There are chantries, actually quite beautiful ones, still all over Europe, still working. Prayers being said for the repose and remission of souls. Pope Benedict, the most reactionary prelate for a considerable time to lead the church, is trying to restore the idea of remission of sin in exchange for donations or other uh, in-kind operations. This is, this is, I'm sorry if it sounds unduly functionalist, but until we've dealt with these questions, we can't have a serious discussion. Now, th there's also, I think, a real problem about anything that's eternal. I'll, I should probably close with this. I, it will happen to all of us that at some point you get tapped on the shoulder and told, not just that the party's over, but slightly worse. The party's going on, but you have to leave. <laughs> and, it's, and it's going on without you. That's, that's, the, that's the reflection, I think, that most upsets people about their demise. All right, then. Let's, because it might make us feel better. Let's pretend the opposite. 
Instead, you'll get tapped on the, sh on the shoulder and told, great news, this party's going on forever, and you can't leave. <laughs> you, you've got to stay. The boss says so, and he also insists that you have a good time. I've read about David's father, and I had a bad time when my own father passed on, but the father proposed by monotheism is the father who doesn't die, who reassures his children, don't worry, I'll never leave you. You'll never see the end of me. You'll never get the chance to feel sorry. I'm always there. I'm the absolute ultimate in dictatorship, and in my courts there's no appeal. Do, do you really think that this would cheer up any one of sentience or humanity, or capable of feeling of irony, I submit it's out of the question. <laughs>